In this video, we will learn to use IUPAC nomenclature to determine the names of alkanes and haloalkanes. Let's unpack this a little bit. IUPAC, I-U-P-A-C, stands for International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, in case you we were wondering what that means. Alkanes is a term that we discussed in a previous video. Remember that alkanes are molecules that have just carbon-carbon single bonds. They are one of our types of hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons referring to molecules that have just carbons and hydrogens and no other atoms present. We'll also apply IUPAC nomenclature to name haloalkanes. Dissecting this name, alkane refers to molecules with just carbon-carbon single bonds. Halo refers to the incorporation of one or more halogen atoms into the molecule. So in other words, rather than having just carbons and hydrogens, in addition, there's at least one fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine molecule. And these are very common in nature and also very common in molecules that are used for practical applications. So by the end of this video, you'll be comfortable with looking at the structure of an alkane or a so-called haloalkane and determining the proper name of that molecule. Knowing the proper nomenclature is important because it allows us to communicate with scientists around the world using the same system of nomenclature. And the IUPAC system is the universally accepted standardized system where scientists from all over the world get together every few years and discuss what the proper rules should be for naming particular organic compounds. So that is what we will use here, enabling us to communicate and refer to the same molecule around the world. Let's go ahead and take a look at these rules for naming and apply them toward naming alkanes and haloalkanes. Amongst the materials provided for this module, you will find a handout that features this information for IUPAC nomenclature of hydrocarbons and halogenated hydrocarbons, meaning haloalkanes as a synonym for that term. So we are going to apply these rules for nomenclature here one step at a time toward an example problem to illustrate how we would go about naming an organic molecule. So we're going to be asked to determine the IUPAC name of the following molecule based on this line angle formula that we can draw out here. So let's go ahead and take a look at this step by step for alkanes and halogenated molecules, haloalkanes in other words. Find the longest carbon chain in the molecule and name that chain according to the table below. The table is going to tell us how to name that longest carbon chain based on the number of carbons in that chain, where we go from methane with one carbon in the longest chain to ethane with two, propane with three, butane with four, all the way up to 10 carbons. The list does go on beyond this, but one through 10 is what you would be expected to apply for purposes of this exercise and this class. In order to find the longest carbon chain, it's what you can trace through without lifting your pencil or backtracking. So let's do as an example of this, we will apply this toward the molecule shown here. So evaluating the IUPAC name for this molecule and applying step one of finding the longest carbon chain, we can start sketching here and finding the longest carbon chain means what I can take my green pen through without having to backtrack or go back over something I've already covered. So I went through in green like I did here because that was the only route, the longest route I should say, that I could take through the molecule that would allow me to not have to lift my pencil or not backtrack in finding that longest pathway. In other words, this longest carbon chain here contains everything in green. It's missing this carbon up here because if we were to include that carbon up there as well as all the others, if we tried to do that, like here, going through, coming up to here, we would have to backtrack, come back down to get over through the rest of the chain. So that's why we don't do that. Likewise, you could just as well have come up with the longest carbon chain starting here and going through the molecule like this. Both the green and the red paths are correct because there is symmetry in the molecule where relative to this carbon atom that I'm highlighting here at the intersection of these lines, there's one carbon coming this way and there's also one carbon coming this way. So these two groups are symmetrical and that's why it doesn't matter whether we start here and go the green route or here, 
going the pink route, they are both going to ultimately end up yielding exactly the same IUPAC name because they'd be referring to exactly the same molecule. So with this in mind, looking at step one here, finding the longest carbon chain, which we refer to as the so-called parent name for the molecule. Much like most of us at birth take the name of one of our parents as our last name, this is going to form the last part of the name of the organic molecule as well. So the parent's name, based on the number of carbons that we have in our longest carbon chain here, we can trace out our number of carbon atoms there in the longest carbon chain. Going either the green route or the pink route, you'll come up with the same number. It would be one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, all highlighted there in yellow dots. Six carbons in the longest carbon chain means that the parent name for this particular molecule is going to be hexane. So I'm just going to jot down parent name equals hexane here doing my scratch paper work because there are six carbons in the longest carbon chain. Hexane and the A-N-E suffix there and throughout all of these represents the fact that there are just carbon-carbon single bonds in the molecule. There's no double bonds and no triple bonds. Now on to step two we are going to number the longest carbon chain beginning at the end closer to a branch. A branch is also known as a substituent. What is a branch? A branch is any atom that has not been counted for in determining the parent chain. So in other words, following that green highlighter that we did, the branches or branch is going to be anything that wasn't highlighted in green. So for clarity, I'm just going to redraw that structure that we had up top here and I'll re-highlight our path that we took through the molecule in green, like so. And you will notice what was missing, what atom was not accounted for there in our journey through the molecule, through the longest carbon chain, was this branch that we had in yellow. So that's what we refer to as a branch. because it was not included in that green chain that we mapped out there. Instead, it comes off of that, hence we call it a branch or a substituent. Now, in order to correctly, fully identify the molecule, we need to be able to identify what that branch is eventually, and we'll get to that in step three. But for now, in step two, we number the longest carbon chain in the molecule, that's what we highlighted in green, beginning at the end closest to a branch. That branch was what we had highlighted in yellow, so therefore, we are going to start numbering that longest carbon chain in the molecule, starting from the end closer to the yellow branch. So we start numbering at the very, very end of the molecule here, coming through. The reason we chose to start at the left end was because that was closer to that yellow branch coming off. So one, two, three, four, five, six makes our parent chain of six carbons, confirming what we saw in part one there, that hexane was the parent name. And then carrying on from there, into part three here, or step three of our nomenclature. Add prefixes to the parent name to specify the name and location of all of the branches. So the name and location of all the branches based on the numbering system we used in step two. The numbering system we used in step two was we accounted for all of the atoms of the main chain here in green. And then we need to bring into the front part of the name that we're going to use before hexane, we will specify the name of this branch and its location. And the location is determined by what position of the parent chain, what position of that green chain does this come off of? It comes off at position number two. So we would describe this branch as being at carbon number two of the parent chain. Now, how do we name the branches? Branches are going to be referred to as alkyl groups if they are carbon containing groups. The YL suffix indicates that it is not the parent chain, but instead something that branches off of the parent chain. So if you look down here at the bottom, we have eight common alkyl groups, or we could think of those alkyl groups as being the branches. So these are the branch names that we have specified down here. You do need to be familiar with these and able to apply them. As we look at these branch names, and I'll zoom in a bit here, You'll notice they all end in YL, methyl being a one carbon branch, ethyl being two carbons, propyl being three carbons. And within these diagrams, the red line that you will see 
going to each here, 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 there, and so on, is what connects to the rest of the molecule. So I'm going to put a zigzaggy line there to emphasize that this is the longest carbon chain that I've drawn as a very abbreviated zigzaggy line, and the branch coming off of it would be a line going to a CH3. Similarly for the ethyl group, longest carbon chain right there is the zigzag line with a two carbon chain coming off of that. The propyl group can be a bit confusing to people compared to other groups. The propyl group comes in a few different varieties. This particular propyl group that's just called propyl indicates that the branch has three carbons that are in a chain that come off of the parent right there. Isopropyl refers to having a chain and then coming off of that chain there is a CH and then two methyl groups branching off of that. So in other words, if this were a line angle formula that we were showing for this isopropyl group in red zigzag line there is the parent chain, the longest carbon chain in the molecule. And then to show the branch coming off, we would show this Y shape, or in my case, an upside down Y shape, where this is the CH group that I'm highlighting here because that's where the lines intersect. And that's where we connect back to the parent chain. And then coming off of that CH is also two methyl groups coming here. And here we refer to that as our so-called isopropyl group. Our butyl group has four carbons. We refer to a uh, structure of four carbons that looks like this as an sec butyl group or s butyl group and again this place where the red line comes off is going to represent where you connect to the parent chain and so if we were trying to draw that as a line angle formula here zigzag line represents the longest carbon chain and then blue I'm making my connection to the branch and the branch is a CH group bonded to a CH3 so I draw an end of the line at the left there to make my CH3 coming to the right we have a CH2 and a CH3 so it looks like so here making our four carbons with the group coming there at the second of those four carbons of the so-called sec butyl group in this branch name diagram you do need to be familiar with and able to apply all of these names toward drawing the structures of organic molecules or if you're given a structure writing out the name for that molecule. So let's go ahead and zoom back out to continue our discussion of describing and determining the IUPAC name for our molecule here. So in this structure we came up with the parent name being hexane we came up with the longest carbon chain there of six carbons. At position number two, there was a branch cut off. That branch has one carbon atom because we accounted for everything in green, including this carbon right here, where we labeled those two. That was all accounted for in the parent name of hexane. So what we have left is this branch in yellow. That branch in yellow has just one carbon. So we'd refer to that as a methyl group. And that methyl group specifically is at position number two of the longest carbon chain that we numbered. So we'd call it a two methyl group. And we always separate numbers from letters using dashes. And that is why I have put two dash methyl there. Now what we do to determine the final and specify the final name of the molecule is this is what we refer to as a prefix in the name. Hexane is our parent name or the suffix of the name. Prefix comes before suffix, so the full name the IUPAC name for the molecule that we have shown up top is going to be 2-methyl-hexane. And you do not need a space between methyl and hexane. Generally, when writing IUPAC names, we separate numbers from letters using dashes, like I have here. And then we leave no space between different words that are strung together without a number in between. So methyl hexane runs together as a single word there in the IUPAC nomenclature system. We can use these rules to name a full plethora of hydrocarbons as well as haloalkanes. Before we stop here, let's do one more example problem of applying this terminology. Let's give this example problem a try applying these three rules again. And I strongly encourage you, 
as we dig into this to hit the pause button, try this problem on your own, see if you get the right answer, and then uh, go from there to view the video to determine whether you've done things correctly or not. As I look at this structure, first thing I need to do is in step one here, find the longest carbon chain, and we're gonna name that longest carbon chain the parent chain according to the names listed below, beginning with methane with one carbon, decane with 10. We'll be somewhere in between those two extreme ends here. So coming up with the parent name here, finding the longest carbon chain, you might be very tempted to start right here and go through like this because intuitively kind of like to start in the lower left corner and sketch through, but molecules can be provided in any sort of rotation or orientation. And so don't assume that you need to start here at the exact left-hand side and left-hand corner. Instead, it could be starting over here, starting up here, wherever it takes to find the longest carbon chain. And in the case of this, if we started right here and we sketched our way through, remember that we can't backtrack and we can't lift our pencil. So sketching through, we could do this as our longest carbon chain. That would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbon atoms. If there's a longer way to trace through the molecule, that's going to be the way that wins. And there is indeed a longer way which is that if we start here or here, doesn't matter whether we start here or here, pick either one, it doesn't matter, you are going to find that you can generate a longer carbon chain. So I'm gonna start right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight is a longer carbon chain than what we'd previously found as the winner, which was seven. So eight is going to win here. So we're mapping out the longest pathway through this molecule. We started here down, down, down. Notice I'm not having to backtrack and I'm not having to lift my pencil, meaning this is a legit longest carbon chain. And I could have just as well started right here where I'm laser pointering and gone through like that. We would come up with the exact same name in the end. So if that was how you took your longest pathway through the molecule, that is a-okay. All right, going through, we start numbering from the end closer to a branch coming off. So I've started numbering from the left-hand end of the molecule upper left here, because that put a branch at the second spot, one, two, and there's a branch coming off there because that's a part that we hadn't highlighted as being part of the parent chain. Whereas if we started the other and we called this number one, this number two, and this number three, we'd have to get to number three before there was that bromine branch coming off. So that's why I started on the left-hand side here, doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the longest carbon chain there in step number two. And we can go ahead and write this out, that this is referred to as octane because there are eight carbons in that longest carbon chain, making that octane, they're all carbon-carbon single bonds, so they get that A-N-E suffix. Now from there, moving onward to step three, we need to specify the name and the location of every single branch coming off the parent chain. We've conveniently highlighted the parent chain in green, so the branches are anything that we have not accounted for in that parent chain, anything that we haven't highlighted in green just yet. Highlighting through those, we have our group here, group here that hadn't been highlighted, and the group over here that hadn't been highlighted. Naming those, we will see in part three here that halogens are named as halo branches, namely, to be specific, fluoro, chloro, bromo, and iodo. This is a bromine, so we'd refer to it as a bromo branch. And to be more specific even beyond that, to indicate exactly where the bromine is in the chain, we need to specify the numerical location based on our numbering system that we devised here. And at position carbon number six of the parent chain, that's where the bromine comes off. So we would call this a six dash bromo, separating numbers from letters using dashes. Now our other branches are we have at position three, a methyl branch. Remember that was our one carbon branch. Indeed, we have one carbon right here. It comes off of the parent at position three, so we call it three methyl. And then we also had at position two a methyl group, so I would call that two methyl. And now you might be tempted to list the name as two methyl, three methyl, but in cases where you have identical groups and there's more than one of it, what it becomes is a merged prefix where with multiple identical branches, such as three branches, then use prefixes, such as di, tri, and tetra, to indicate how many branches are present. For example, dimethyl, and that's what we're gonna use 
as the case here. So we'd refer to two muscle groups as a dimethyl group or dimethyl branch. And we do have to specify the numerical location of each of those. So there was one methyl branch at position two and one at position three. So we do two comma three and then dash to separate numbers from letters. So two, three dimethyl would be the appropriate name to encompass both of those methyl branches. We also have to incorporate 6-bromo into our final name and remembering that we alphabetize these prefixes, which are the YL groups, methyl or dimethyl and bromo. We alphabetize those and plug them in in front of the parent name, which we previously determined was octane. So writing this all out, octane is the parent name. And then to alphabetize, here's a caveat. We ignore terms that indicate how many of a particular group there are. So hence the die gets dropped when determining the alphabetization. And we alphabetize based on M for methyl and B for bromo. So B comes before M and therefore the name of this molecule will be 6-bromo, alphabetizing based on the B, 2 comma three dimethyl again alphabetizing based on the m in methyl because we alphabetize based on the identity of the group rather than how many of it there are so six bromo two three dimethyl and i'm just making a note that we alphabetize these six bromo two three dimethyl octane and we are going to call us good to go on getting the complete IUPAC name of this molecule where it's always useful to double check and confirm that you have accounted for all the atoms in the longest carbon chain. That was eight in total, all highlighted in green. And you've accounted for all the branches, meaning everything that you didn't highlight in green, you highlighted in pink, came up with the name for it as a branch, and you listed those branch names in alphabetical order and included the numerical location of them based on how you'd numbered the parent chain.